So the next important part of turbulent plume theory that we need is the distribution of concentration of particles or droplets in this case that are injected with the fluid at the source. So as we've just derived, the concentration C in this case, we could refer to infection quanta in infectious aerosols relative to that leaving the mouth, which is we've called CQ, scales as square root of area of the mouth divided by alpha x, where alpha is the turbulent entrainment coefficient around 0.1 or 0.15. And that leads to a jet which uh, grows in size and grows in fluctuations as you see more and more eddies and eventually might even bend due to flows in the room or thermal buoyancy effects. Um, and I'd like to talk about the difference between short range transmission due to really placing yourself in this jet and breathing that air directly, which is more concentrated than the background, and then compare that with the transmission in the well-mixed room that we've been talking about all along. So obviously, if we're at position zero here, right at the mouth, this is the worst case scenario. So if we're here, let's say we're only uh, you know, one inch or one centimeter away, and we put our mouth on top of the other person's mouth, that is the worst case scenario of short range transmission. -er. Okay, that is relative to the background room, we're getting a much worse situation there. Um, but if we ask ourselves how much worse is it, so we know that um, FD is the dilution factor, that is the concentration kind of at the, um, is you know at, at the uh, source relative to C sort of at infinity in the well mixed room. So let's just say far away. Okay, so the average. Actually, instead of C infinity, I should call that C average um, because it is the average concentration um, in the room. And we have seen that the dilution factor uh, can be written as the flow rate of the breath uh, divided by the uh, sort of uh, decay rate of the concentration field uh, at the average, uh, at the appropriately defined mean radius, divided by the volume of the room. So that is telling us how much more concentrated the infection quanta or viruses are here versus the well-mixed room, where they're really spread out. Now, how big is this factor? So this factor uh, for the Skagit Choir, which we've analyzed, the Skagit Valley Corral, uh, so that was a fairly large room, 4.5 meter ceiling, uh, but it didn't have very good ventilation. So that's sort of a si similar to smaller rooms with better ventilation. And in that case, this number was 10 to the minus three, okay? And in general, you know, FD for typical indoor spaces for offices, classrooms, and homes is on the order of 10 to the minus two to the 10 to the minus four. So there's quite a significant difference. If you are right at the point of somebody's mouth and breathing in their air versus being far away, there really is a big difference. To put it in perspective, we could ask ourselves, well, how long would you have to stay in the well-mixed room far away, breathing the air, to have the same exposure as if, and dose of infection quanta, as if you put your mouth on top of somebody else and breathed in one lung full of air. So if we just say that, if we calculate it as a time scale, um, taking in the volume of a single breath and then dividing that by Q breath and the dilution factor, that is the time you would have to spend breathing the background air uh, in order to uh, achieve the same, uh, in order to achieve the same dose, and this quantity ends up being for the Skag Choir that we've calculated uh, around uh, one hour. So, if 63 people were in the room and you know 53 or so were infected, then that most likely happened through the airborne route, as we've discussed, because 53 people were mostly breathing the background air that was perhaps well mixed. On the other hand, you also could infect 53 people by taking turns one at a time, putting their lips against the other person who's infected and just breathing in one full lung full of air. Then you would get uh, you know, a similar number of people infected on the order of an uh, hour or two, which is the length of time of that choir practice. But we know that didn't happen. 
So that already tells us that short-range transmission really can't explain what happened in the Skagit Choir, and as we've discussed, it has to be longer-range airborne aerosol transmission, but how much longer range? We can also sample at different positions here, so that's the absolute worst case scenario. Um, so let's consider uh, as important numbers three feet and six feet. So three feet corresponds to uh, one meter, which is the social distancing guideline of the World Health Organization today. I would also argue that three or maybe two feet is kind of close to what you might call natural social distancing. So if you don't impose social distancing, uh, most people prefer to have a little space bubble around them. They don't want to be right up against somebody if they don't have to, and they tend to stand two or three feet apart. So somewhere in here is what I would call natural social distancing, except in cases where you're in a crowd. So if you're in a nightclub or bar or some crowded space where you're starting to press against people, then you come closer. You might be one foot or half a foot, and you might start to get closer to this worst case. But you know, people tend to be about three feet apart. So we can ask ourselves what happens there. We can also look a little further. The Center for Disease Control in the United States uh, has imposed a six-foot rule, as we have discussed. In fact, it's been uh, interpreted so strictly in the United States that you can find floor stickers exactly six feet apart in all sorts of indoor spaces, even when people are wearing masks, and when we aren't sure exactly what the flows are like. And we can ask ourselves, what, 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 what is the sort of level of concentration uh, there? Um, it's also worth noting uh, that we can also look at a negative value. How about minus three feet? Uh, because it's important to note that respiratory jets do not only increase your risk relative to the well-mixed ambient, there must be regions where the risk is actually lower than the well-mixed ambient because in the end, the well-mixed solution was obtained by mass balance. So that means we've essentially counted all the infection quanta or virions in the room, and if there's a higher concentration here, there must be a lower concentration somewhere else to account for that. So perhaps if you're standing behind somebody at a reasonable distance, you actually have a lower concentration, although there's still mixing going on and you will be exposed to the well-mixed room. Which then brings me to the way that we should really think about the role of short-range transmission versus long-range transmission, and that is to compare the concentration of the respiratory jet to that of the well-mixed ambient that we calculated. That's essentially the definition of when the, uh, there's a transition from short-range to long-range uh, behavior. So where will that occur? It will typically be somewhere here. So there's a certain position which we'll call uh, xc, and this will be defined by saying that c over the initial value um, is equal to the dilution factor. So this is the point where if I you know, follow this orange curve, I've just hit the concentration that is predicted for the background well-mixed room, which we've already calculated uh, before. So if you use our formula for c there, you, see, uh, you then get a formula for this, this xc, which is, uh, square root of the mouth area uh, times uh, lambda c of r bar, so the, the decay rate of the concentration field, the volume of the room, and then alpha uh, qb. So I would argue that this is really the boundary which separates uh, long-range airborne transmission by aerosols with short-range transmission, which also includes aerosols, by the way. So some of these aerosol droplets you definitely could be inhaling anywhere in here, but if you go long-range, you're only talking about the aerosol droplets. So this is really where the dividing line is, and if you plug in numbers for different settings, you'll find this is often larger than six feet. In fact, in some cases, in many cases, it's actually larger than the room. It could be tens of meters even, because this dilution factor can be of order, uh, you know, a factor of 100 or even 10,000 lower concentration in the well-mixed room than at the person's mouth. So you have to go pretty far away to see it actually drop back down. What that means is that when people are breathing in a room, these breaths are crossing all over the place, they're mixing, and you really can't think about a turbulent plume lasting, you know, out to infinity because there's another person standing here, there's ventilation flow, there are thermal flows, all of the mechanisms we talked about mixing will take this jet and start to mix it around the room so it won't look like a perfect jet all the way. 
but at least this gives us an estimate for these closer spacings here of sort of what our risk might be. So using this concept, um, you know, I'll just mention this is typically much bigger than six feet, we could estimate how much worse is it to be six feet or three feet away with yourself in a worst case scenario, perfectly placed in a respiratory jet. So what we're asking here is what if we were unlucky enough to be, you know, right here and breathing in uh, for a long period of time. So not just for a fleeting second, but you're sitting there and just over and over, you're just sitting here breathing in that person's breath. It's not an unreasonable situation. You could imagine at a meeting when two people are sitting at a table or maybe they're having dinner, masks are off, they are facing each other, talking to each other, and in fact, that is a high-risk situation in terms of this kind of transmission. So let's see how much worse it actually could be. Well, if you plug in the numbers, uh, then um, using uh, a typical mouth area, in this case, the concentration uh, drops to about 6%. In this case, the concentration, since it uh, goes as one over distance, is more like 3%. So it's a very rough calculation, but relative, and I should say, so relative to the highest concentration of reaching the mouth, the plume has been diluted down to 6% or 3% as you go these distances. Notice there's not a massive difference uh, between 3 and 6. And, and it does make a very big difference in terms of decisions to reopen spaces and how people interact, whether you're strictly six feet apart or perhaps you can be three. So keep in mind that three to six percent dilution. But what we're really interested in here is now how do these fractions compare with the well-mixed room? And so for that, I actually would like to do a different comparison as I'd like to do C over FD because FD relative to here is the concentration uh, far away. So I want C over CQ, um, I should say, um, over, over FD. And so this also can be written as XC over X. So it's basically how much farther is that crossover point relative to where you're standing. That's another way to think about it. Um, and this is then 6 to 600. So this is the excess risk. If you were to stand three feet away, that's the excess risk you face from short range transmission if you are 100% of the time breathing in the jet of the infected person you know, pointing right at you all the time. If you take this uh, six foot rule, it's a little bit less strong. You have a C over CQ divided by FD it is more like three to 300, okay? And again, depends on the details of the room, uh, but it still can be a significant factor. So uh, we will come back to uh, thinking about how to handle short range transmission in light of its interaction with long range. Uh, but let me make one final comment on this discussion, which is where is this crossover point? So notice it scales with volume. So. Something you may be wondering is, don't we have airborne transmission and shore range transmission outdoors also? Yes, and that is actually covered by the theoretic arguments that we're making here. Although, I, as I said, these jets really can't last forever. But we can at least say to ourselves, what happens as V goes to infinity? So I, I like to call this the outdoor limit. If you apply our safety criterion for a well-mixed room to a very big room, think of, for example, a gymnasium or a, uh, a sports stadium, very, very big room, then if there's only one infected person, then the dilution of those droplets in a massive space is almost, it's like being outside. You might as well be outside. And what you find then is the crossover is very far away, which means the long range analysis is not even helpful. It's not even valid. Really, it's the short range analysis you'd be thinking about, okay? Now, unfortunately, the short range analysis depends on many assumptions about how people are positioned, how they're interacting, what are the local flow fields, but you have to deal with short range transmission and social distancing can play a role in how you address that threat. But once you get to smaller rooms and longer periods of time, um, and uh, th then you actually find that this XC is on the order of the room size, and then you really are going to be having uh, significant effects of long range transmission. And I will argue that for most typical rooms uh, that we uh, inhabit indoors, that the long range airborne risk is the leading order 
first approximation and best approximation, and the short-range risk must be considered, but it's a correction to that. 